let's get rid of that. So last time. Oh. Hey, <laughs> hey um, um, before you start, I was just curious if I was able to get access to like the previous videos that you've done before. The previous just, videos? Like lectures or whatever. Like, yeah, I, um, I've only started joining like last, like this week. So I would love to. Oh, okay. Yes. So do you know how to access the class website? No, I don't have that. Okay. I'm going to put the link to it in the chat. And awesome. here you can find under the lectures tab, all of the recorded lectures are linked on my Vimeo at the top of that page. And you can also look at the lectures themselves on that page. Okay, cool. Thank so, you. Mm -hmm. And we're currently on, um, we're finishing up just a couple of last things about MDMA and MDMA like drugs today, and then moving on to stimulants. And we'll probably get like halfway through stimulants today if I had to guess, because I'm taking okay. my time. Okay, let's get started. So previously on drugs go, I have this cookie in my hand, like I'm going to eat it, but I feel like that'd be rude. It's like, put it down. Um, so we just finished talking about MDMA and MDMA-like drugs, generally speaking. Um, but there are a couple more things that I want to go over here, especially because there were a lot of questions about spacing, about redosing, um, about interactions with SSRIs, and kind of how frequently to roll and like what the safety of that is. So I want to touch on those things before we move on because they're really relevant, especially to a lot of people here that work in harm reduction. And I want to make sure that we have time to go over any questions pertaining to those things. So what we'd said prior, just kind of recap a little bit. Um, if you have the opportunity, I recommend buying crystals instead of pills or powder. With pills, you have no idea how much, like pressed pills, you have no idea how many milligrams of MDMA are in them, which can be a problem, right? Because you might accidentally eat like half of a Punisher might be 150 milligrams of MDMA, and that might be too much for you. Or that's just like more than you want to be doing in that night. Um, staying hydrated is essential, but if you're drinking so much water that you feel your kidneys hurting, you should probably stop and hold off a little bit. Heat stroke and overheating is the number one biggest concern with rolling. Um, staying cool is the biggest safety tip that I can possibly give you while rolling. This is essential. Does anyone remember why? Does anyone remember why overheating is so dangerous? Because your enzymes stop working. Yes, nice. Your antioxidants are less effective in higher internal temperatures. And there's another reason for that too. Um, what can be a complication of your, of your body temperature being too high? Does anyone know this one? You might not. Guesses though. What might happen if your body temperature is too high? Seizures. Seizures, that's correct. And also cardiac arrest. Um, can happen because usually this heightened body temperature is accompanied with other complications as well. So staying cool, very important on all drugs in general, but especially MDMA because it raises your body temperature a lot, like a lot. Um, I'm, I'm begging you guys to space your rolls out <laughs> on my knees. Um, not necessarily because we have hard and fast evidence right now of how frequently you can safely roll, um, without any kind of negative side effects, but because on a, a broad anecdotal scale, if you roll too frequently, and in my words, too frequently would be considered, in my opinion, to be like more than two or three times a year, then you are putting yourself at risk of having reduced ability to, to roll over time. And this might happen as quickly as a couple of years, excuse me, I'm just chug tea, a couple of years after you start rolling. So I highly recommend spacing out your rolls because just in case you don't want to be at risk of not being able to participate in this drug anymore if it's something that is really valuable for you. So I just want to put that out there. And if people have questions about spacing, when we're done with this, you can come back and ask them. Um, first time dosing is calculated at 1.5 milligrams for per kilogram. So, and again, this is a recap from last time. So I'm just going over this again, because it's so important. For someone that's my body weight, approximately 85 milligrams of MDMA. Now, a lot of people just can't roll sufficiently off of that quantity, even though that's the responsible first dose. So I do recommend kind of like starting there, but some people need 125 milligrams for first dose. In therapeutic context, when MAPS does um, psychotherapy assisted MDMA usage, 
usually they'll have two groups. I believe, Ray, maybe you'll know more about this than me, but I believe that it's usually either an 80 milligram group or a 125 milligram group. Is that correct? I know that there's definitely a 125 milligram group that has shown more efficacy than the lower dosage group. So I thought the ideal dosage that they found was just about like, uh, nine, like around the 90 milligram. Really? Okay. I'll have to look into that again. Um, in my experience, a lot of people to get what they sufficiently consider to be a recreational role, 125 milligrams is a sweet spot for a lot of people. However, I always recommend starting at 100. I think that 100 is a really good starting dose for a lot of people, and a lot of people find that they don't really need much more than that. A lot of people can roll off of 80, 75 milligrams. So start low, go slow, because the lower you start, the more time you'll have before an inherent tolerance builds, because it does through time. Um, always remember to check your interactions, even if you don't think that they'll be of particular concern, because even minor things, like even certain foods can interact with the drugs that you're taking, the medications that you're on, even if it's just some random supplement. Um, for instance, St. John's wort is a supplement that a lot of people take for mood lifting purposes without realizing that it can cause serotonin syndrome if you combine it with other drugs. And a lot of people that take St. John's wort as a supplement might take it in conjunction with MDMA or an SSRI and then discover, oh, why do I feel really terrible right now? But because they didn't research their interactions because they didn't know. So always look those up. Now, supplements, I feel strongly about supplements as being a good precautionary measure, but we don't have sufficient full-blown evidence yet to show that supplements are like truly fully effective at what we think that they do. Personally speaking, I don't think that there's any harm in having a good developed supplement regimen, and I'll post, I'll post this on the website and I'll like send it out to people that want it, but I have a full post and preload regimen um, that I've constructed. Um, Ray says, MAPS Internet Machine says their groups are 80 or 120 milligrams. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought, is that there was an 80 and 100, I thought it was 125, but yeah, 80 or 120 is what they're using in clinical trials. Um, when you're pre and post loading, Post-loading is taking supplements after you roll. Pre-loading is taking them before you roll. Post-loading does not do much. You've already taken the drug. So there are a lot of um, like post-party packs out there on Amazon or other websites. Fuck these, don't buy Amazon. That contain things that you're supposed to take after you've rolled already. And while those can reduce your symptoms, like how you're feeling intrinsically, they're not gonna protect you because whatever's happened, if there's any like strain or damage done to your system, it's already happened. So um, preloading is really the way to go here. And like I said, I can give you a list of preload supplements if you'd like, but the purpose of preloading is effectively to hunker down your brain's defenses before you roll. Doesn't mean that you're making your roll safe. No, it doesn't. Does it mean that you're fully negating all the negative effects of this role? No, it doesn't. Does it have the possibility of making you feel a lot more grounded and less shaken afterwards if you're prone to bad come downs? Yeah, it can help. It really can. Um, pre and post loading is no joke. It's a great way of reducing or minimizing the risks affiliated with rolling. And a lot of the preload regimen involves antioxidants. And I hope that would make sense to you guys because remember, in high internal body temperatures, your antioxidants are less effective, but also your antioxidants are what are responsible for breaking down the toxic metabolites of MDMA. So if you have a fortified antioxidant system, you therefore are potentially more equipped to handle the process of addressing the deleterious consequences of rolling. So I do really endorse this. 5-HTP um, is touted by like everyone and their dog as being the thing that is like, oh, just take 5-HTP after you roll and it's going to be fine, like no problem. Fuck that. I really hate that. It just drives me mad because it, it makes people feel like they can roll and then take 5-HTP afterwards and be like, oh, it's good. Like I'm fine. This is going to replenish my serotonin. Do we really think it's that simple? Because if it were, I feel like everyone would just be able to roll really frequently and take 5-HTP and not experience consequences, right? I have heard that 5-HTP does not pass the blood-brain barrier. I believe that that's correct. I don't know enough about this to speak with certainty at the top of my head, but I've researched this in the past. And there's a lot of conflicting evidence about 5-HTP's efficacy. It's not as simple as just being like, oh, take this and your brain will make more serotonin. Otherwise, we would be doing that. There's a whole reason is that no god-fucking or no period god-fucking. Um, hey, if you meet God and you have sex, then tell me all about it. 
but this is specifically like no god fucking but i love the good question very important clarification that we need to make um, however, 5-HTP for some people can be a symptom re reliever. So if you're experiencing a really hard come down or crash the day after, wait 24 hours before you take 5-HTP. And you should not take it before you roll, only take it after if you really want to. It's not the most important supplement to take. It might relieve how you're feeling. If you take it within 24 hours of your roll on the other end, you might be prone to serotonin syndrome actually at that point because you haven't fully metabolized MDMA yet. Um, EGCG might help, that's green tea, might help 5-HTP blood, but pass the blood brain barrier. Yes. I'm glad that everyone's discussing the grammar of this slide. <laughs> so we can pick that up. Um, yes, that is true that they're showing actually the efficacy of green tea in a lot of things. There's some preliminary evidence that consuming green tea prior to consuming ketamine might reduce your likelihood of having bladder toxicity. But these are really preliminary studies. So take these with a grain of salt, but generally speaking, green tea is not going to interact majorly with anything and might actually like improve the effectiveness of a lot of these things. I highly recommend having a full day to recover after you roll. The day after you roll, I think is typically a throwaway day, unless you've somehow packed it with activities back to back and then you just plow through the day and you're so tired by the end that you didn't really have time to think about the fact that you felt a little bit like emptier than usual. If you've rolled really hard the night before, you might wake up the next morning and be like, I am devoid of emotion. So be careful. Rolling in a reasonable dose will reduce those possibilities. Okay. Please don't try and microdose, Molly. Please. I just, I can't stress this enough. I support your bodily sovereignty. If you microdose MDMA, you're putting yourself at risk for just like continuous receptor downregulation because your brain is going to be like, well, I mean, we have this like slightly elite or slightly exacerbated amount of serotonin getting released, but like this just doesn't seem right and it's continuous. And also you won't even roll, like you won't really feel it by microdosing MDMA. You might get like mild stimulation, but you won't hit threshold unless you're actually rolling. And at that point you might as well just take amphetamine. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, microdosing with a lot of things does not work in the same way that it does with psychedelics. So please keep this in mind. In fact, even microdosing something like Adderall can actually have the opposite desired effect and reduce the effectiveness of dopamine in your brain. So do careful research before even like looking at microdosing anything. <laughs> now, rollsafe.org, I think is a wonderful website. It's not perfect. Take all that it has with a grain of salt, but we need to remember that there are only so many good, reputable resources available for like harm reduction for these kinds of drugs, and rollsafe.org I think is a really good one. This website, the DEA.org, when I first came across that, I thought it was the actual DEA for a minute and was super confused about why the whole website was dedicated to dismantling scandals around Molly. <laughs> I was like, these guys are really advanced since I last saw them. But this website is fascinating. It goes into a very in-depth history of a lot of the scandals behind MDMA. The science on this site, I think, is a little bit questionable. So don't like fully dive into it, but it's a good place to start and get more information. Cool. Now, um, before we dive into stimulants, there was one more thing from last time we talked about um, SSRIs and rolling. And someone emailed me to ask for further clarification on this, and I will like resend what I said in response to everyone so that you have this because this is a very commonly asked question. The TLDR is that SSRIs are what is what are known as competitive agonists. So the way that SSRIs work, right, is they jam themselves in the reuptake transporter, thereby meaning that serotonin will accumulate in the synapse and be able to thing more. It basically is more bang for your buck as in the past. Now, when you have MDMA, remember that MDMA exerts its effects partially by getting sucked in through that transporter, popping the neurotransmitter bubbles, and then flipping the transporters. But SRIs are just more effective at going into the transporters than MDMA is. And what this means is that it's the two of them butting heads for space in that transporter, and the SSRIs will a lot of the time win. So you have these two chemicals in here that are trying to do their thing, and like one of them is a little bit beefier than the other in terms of its efficacy, which means that if you're on SSRIs, MDMA is just not going to be able to do its job like as well. And for a lot of people, this 
means that their role is just greatly reduced or it just doesn't feel quite as sparkly. For some people that are on certain low doses of SSRIs, they can just like roll like normal. And this is kind of unpredictable, which is a problem. Like people don't always know what to expect from this. Some people have a consistency, some, are, some people don't. But the real issue that we, that we see here is not necessarily that someone would take their normal dose of Molly on SSRIs. That's not actually that big of a risk because like, yes, you're still going to have those toxic metabolites of MDMA in your system. And that's a problem. Like, even if you don't feel the roll, you still have some of the consequences of rolling and you need to, to space it like you've rolled. Like you need to treat it like you've rolled. Um, but the issue is that people often will take like six or seven times the amount of Molly that they normally would to break through. And that's where we see a real, a real problem because again, like you're still going to have those metabolites in your system. It still has the potential to cause oxidative stress and make you feel shitty. Um, and in those cases, it does have the potential to cause serotonin syndrome. So if you know someone, I, I literally was on the, I was like with a friend of mine a couple of years ago and she wanted to ask her friend what he thought about rolling on SSRI. So she called him and said, hey, like you're on SSRIs, how do you roll at festivals? And he was like, oh, you just take like eight or 900 milligrams. Like, don't worry, you'll eventually break through and get there. And that's not harm reduction. <laughs> that is extraordinarily high. Right, yes, I know, I'm, yeah, uh, what? Yeah, I know, I'm aware. Um, like people do that. People think that they can just take like a shitload of molly and push through that barrier. And it's quite dangerous. So TLDR is if you're on SSRIs and you want to try to roll on a dose that isn't like that much higher than your normal one, you can try it. And it like, I'll be honest, it's probably not that dangerous, but you might not roll in the first place and that can be very uncomfortable. So it's kind of like a push pull of what you want. MAOIs on the other hand, and other similarly acting antidepressants could pose a real serious health, health risk if combined with MDMA. So that's that. Does anyone have questions on clarifying that? Because I know that, no, yeah. <laughs> I know that a lot of people have questions about SSRIs. Does anyone have questions on that particular subject? Anything else about Molly before we move on? Yeah, do you happen to know about the atypical antipsychotics and anti Actually, because dissociatives and psychedelics induce a psychotic like state. Like when you're on psychedelics, you exhibit psychotic symptoms, actually. And the same with dissociatives. If I remember correctly, dissociatives actually more so than psychedelics, which surprised researchers. Um, when it comes to something like MDMA, the risk is probably not quite as high, but I definitely would anticipate that there is some kind of interaction there that you should look out for. Um, however, I don't want to speak too confidently on that one without looking at the interactions personally. So if you have specific questions, then you hit me with the medication and dosage and we can talk. Okay. Any, any other questions about MDMA-like drugs before we move on to stimulants? Okay. All right. Before we do that, what are some possible causes of MDMA toxicity, neurotoxicity? Like how might someone incur neurotoxicity from MDMA? How might that happen or be exacerbated more likely to happen? Overheating. Excellent, overheating. Think about the planning process or like the conditions under which you roll. Dehydration. Dehydration. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good guess, but dehydration would not necessarily contribute, I don't think, to neurotoxicity, but it can certainly contribute to other health complications, 100%. That's it, that is a really big risk. I'll give a hint of one of them and see if you guys can get, can get the next one. One of the ones that I'm thinking of is rolling too frequently. So kind of in that vein, thinking about how you would go about planning your role what, what steps you would go through to plan your role? What's something else that you might do that would put you at higher risk of neurotoxicity? Uh, 
taking too many pills? Exactly. Yes, that's right. And poor spacing. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of is rolling too frequently. Nice. So taking too much, um, rolling too often, having too high of a temperature, but also mixing things, combining with other drugs might be a risk here. Um, what are some ways that we can reduce harm while rolling? Things that we can do to make this less risky. Think about environment. Not drink too much water, but enough. Excellent, that's right. Preventing dehydration, super important. You want neither hypernatremia, which is too much water, nor hyponatremia, which is too little water. What yeah. else? What's a major one? Biggest danger of rolling. Overheating. Nice, exactly. Overheating is a really big issue. So we have dehydration, overheating, and I forget what else I have here. So I'll just, oh yeah, spacing adequately and working your way up. Um, these are all really important. They, they might seem basic, but there are things that I would say a, a massive percentage of people that use MDMA don't actually observe. Like this, even something this small as following these four things of hydrating adequately, not overheating, no rolling in a hot tub. I'm so sorry. Um, spacing your rolls adequately, whatever that means for you, and working your way up. Really important. Um, what can happen to serotonin receptors if a person rolls too much or too often? What's the term for this? Anyone remember? Receptor down regulation. Yes, excellent, excellent. Very impressed. Nice. Receptor down regulation. Question Can you speak a little bit about re ups? I absolutely can. So, when you re-up, and for those of you that are not familiar, re-upping is just taking more. Um, the standard practice is to re-up between an hour and a half to two hours after you dose on approximately one third to one half of your original dose. Now, my personal sentiment and my personal recommendation is to not re-up at all. The reason being that you will cumul cumulatively have consumed more MDMA over the course of the night, which will indeed increase your risk of having a harsher come down, which will indeed increase your risk of having a harder crash. It does prolong the length of your roll by approximately an hour if you do it properly. And my, I personally feel as though the opportunity cost of that is not great. And also I, I do feel like there is something to be said for going into a drug experience, knowing that you're gonna come down and making peace with that knowledge beforehand. I think that there is something that it's very, um, I don't even know how to accurately describe this, but it's kind of like, it, it makes the experience, in my opinion, feel more like well-rounded, more balanced, I suppose. I do think that a really good goal to have in any kind of recreational drug setting is that you want to have accounted for before, during, and after the drug experience. So if you're going balls to the wall and having a really hedonistic night, but you lose a whole like three days afterwards, I think that's something that might, in my opinion at least, is not necessarily like the most like balanced way of, of ingestion. However, I'm not to speak on a moral high ground here, that's just what I would recommend. If we're speaking about low and slow, wouldn't you need to re-up potentially? No. Um, what low and slow means is that you start at a certain dose, except that that is your dose for that night. And if it's not quite enough for you, then next time you roll, you up your dose by five or 10 milligrams until you reach a sweet spot. That's what I recommend doing. So for instance, if you start out at 100 milligrams and it's just way too low, then sure, you could try 120, but if you start at 100 milligrams and you're like, that was like really great, but I feel like I could have pushed it a bit more, next time do 105. That's what I mean by low and slow, is increment your dose until you, you reach the minimum amount that you, that you need to have a really good experience. That way you're not starting out with something way higher than you need, because once you've established that tolerance, it's really hard, if not impossible, to bring it back down. Um, in terms of re-upping, like I said, I would recommend not re-upping personally. I do think that it really does increase the amount of crash that comes from the experience. However, like I said, it's very important to time it right. And the reason is this. When you take your molly, most people will start coming up within 30 to 60 minutes of that. And then after that, you only have about an hour and a half of peaking after you've come up.
So if you take your new dose, if you take your re-up after like three hours, you'll start to come down and then you'll feel yourself coming up again. And this sets a behavioral precedent. This sets a precedent in your brain that if you start to feel yourself coming down, you can just take more and come up again. And that's what causes fiending. That's what causes people to feel like they are like compulsed to redose more and more. So if you time it so that you take your new dose within an hour and a half of taking your original dose, regardless of when you've come up, then you'll have a smoothed out peak that extends by about an hour. So if you choose to do it, that's the timeline that you should do it on for real, because it's much better to have a, like a continuous peak that maybe goes up a little bit than to come down and come up again. Yeah, no problem. What drug did Dr. Ricart mix up with MDMA? Biggest scandal in drug history? Meth. Methamphetamine, that's right. Mixed up the vials. Oops, I used meth by accident, and that's why all my monkeys have destroyed dopamine systems. Oops. $1.3 million experiment. Um, why doesn't microdosing MDMA work? Positive downregulation. That's right, receptor downregulation. If you're taking it every day, your receptors are going to get sucked back in like Homer Simpson into a bush. What are some of the differences between MDMA and MDA? The other M. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> MDA is slightly uh, psychedelic and has. Yes. Yep. That's right. MDA is slightly psychedelic. What else? What other properties does it have? Speedier. Yes, it is more stimulating. That's actually why, on the tail end of a roll on MDMA, you start to feel more of that amphetamine-like stimulation when your mind isn't rolling anymore because as your body breaks down MDMA into MDA, there's more of that amphetamine component. There's more of that stimulation component. So actually part of the reason that people recommend to drink grapefruit juice before you roll that day is that there's an enzyme in your liver called the CYP450 enzyme group. And it's responsible for breaking down a lot of major drugs in your system. I've mentioned this before. It's the reason that it interacts with SSRIs and antidepressants. Now, when you take grapefruit juice, when you drink grapefruit juice or eat grapefruit before you roll, that enzyme inhibition will prevent your liver from breaking down MDMA into MDA as effectively. Interesting, right? So it means that it has the potential to make the end of your roll feel a little less stimulating as you come down. Science is crazy. Um, what is eye wiggling called? Anyone remember the scientific term for this? It starts with an N. You might not, so I'll give it five seconds. Hmm? Yes, cat, nice, nystagmus, that's correct, nystagmus. This is a normal part of rolling, however, if your eyes are wiggling so hard you can't text your mom to say goodnight, you probably have taken a little bit too much. What is it called when you are tooth grinding and jaw clenching? What is a term for this, a slang term that starts with a G? Or really any slang term for this, I'll accept. The slang is uh, gurning, but isn't it like yes. bruxism? Yes, both of the, excellent, nice. Bruxism and trismus are the two that, um, jaw clenching and tooth grinding. That's gurning. And then what is it called when you're floored? Oh, I just said it, you're floored. So that's, you're so high, you're just on the ground experiencing sensations. <laughs> Mr. Avery is living in the moment. How many times can I say that? Let's talk about stimulants. So ATS, especially in government literature and in legislature, refers to amphetamine type stimulants. So this phrase ATS, is just like a stimulant with amphetamine type qualities or amphetamine like qualities. And this actually covers a really broad range of things. In fact, cocaine is considered to be an amphetamine type stimulant. Ray, correct me if I'm wrong on that, actually. Just like a, a tiny seed of doubt in my mind, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case, right? Uh, it, sorry, can you repeat that? Whether or not amphetamine or cocaine is considered to be an ATS? Um. I guess I believe under, 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 they kind of act similarly, but uh, amphetamines act a little bit differently. Well, yes, but in terms of like legislature, it, I think that there's a major international treaty that broadly, like the second one in the 70s, that broadly classifies amphetamine type stimulants and includes cocaine under that umbrella. Oh. 
maybe. So, yeah. So overall, and I'm sure that some of you are already familiar with this, generally speaking, but overall, stimulants make you feel energized. There's no shock here. This is not the extent that we're going to go into this, don't worry. But also feelings of grandeur, feelings of being capable and strong and able and sociable and attractive often come from stimulants. This can often come in the form of not needing to sleep as much, being more productive, but also in some cases can manifest itself in the form of aggression or being particularly cocky or proud or talkative, um, sometimes excessively sociable in ways that are not as entertaining to others as they are to you. Um, as this is particularly prominent, like a raised heart rate, raised blood pressure, and also inability to eat appetite suppression. Suppression is like a big part of a lot of drugs. Psychedelics and MDMA-like drugs and stimulants will all suppress your appetite, um, which can be a problem for people that are prescribed amphetamine. Like there can be issues with appetite suppression here. So a couple of, there are actually quite a few terms related to stimulants that I want to get out of the way. Now this one, Funding is an interesting one, and we usually see these, these terms are, are for high dose or chronic administration of stimulants. Punding is repetitive obsessive motion, and we see punding in Parkinson's patients a lot of the time. It's like organizing or repetitively doing something, and this is related to dopamine dysfunction. So sometimes people that are high chronic heavy stimulant users may exhibit obsessive organizational properties like punding. Then there's stimulant psychosis, which is simply psychosis, but from stimulants. And this is usually, if not just often, brought about by lack of sleep, especially in people that are using stimulants on a daily basis in heavy doses. Um, lack of sleep can become a major indicator of a psychotic episode that is coming on, especially 72 hours is usually the cutoff where someone who has not slept for three days is at very high risk for developing psychosis. And stimulants just make it more likely that someone would be up for three days, basically. Um, then there's pruritus, which is skin picking and itching, right? And this is actually not for the reasons that people think it is. A lot of the time when people have skin picking or itching from opioids or from stimulants, this is actually due to decreased blood flow. And in the case of stimulants, you have vasoconstriction, right? You have like tightened blood vessels. And the reason that you might experience this, this skin picking picking or itching or sores is that you're not getting enough blood flow to your face or other areas of your skin that would normally need blood flow in order to repair tissue. So this is a huge part of the stigmas that we see around like meth sores and stuff like that. It often is just because people have like less blood flow to their skin so it doesn't repair itself as well. Um, so vasoconstriction is, again, shrinking of your blood vessels. It makes them smaller. And when your blood, your blood vessels are shrinking and your blood pressure is going up at the same time, this can be a recipe for strokes and other similar complications, right? Because if you have a lot of pressure going through a really small tube, then sometimes people that are on really high doses of stimulants might be at heightened risk of having a, a blood vessel burst in their brain, cause surrounding bleeding and damaged tissue. So on, on stimulants, I'm sorry, I'm having such a hard time talking today. On stimulants such as 4-FA, who I actually spoke with someone at length about the other day, um, this is a problem that we see fairly frequently where people actually experience strokes and brain bleeds because there's so much pressure in the blood vessels in their brain. This is not common at lower doses of stimulants, but especially if you have high blood pressure to begin with, this is a very high risk. Um, mydriasis, again, is blown out eyes. It's dilated pupils. Now, I would say that this is more common on things like cocaine because cocaine has a higher prevalence of acting serotonin than other major stimulants do. And serotonin, as we've seen in the past, is a neurotransmitter that will lead to dilated pupils. So someone on coke is going to have more dilated pupils than someone on amphetamine or methamphetamine, although those people might have mildly dilated pupils. But coke will really dilate your pupils. And then there's appetite suppressant. And if you're unlucky, you might look at your salad very sadly as well and not be able to eat it for several days. Right. In terms of diseases and disorders, I'm sure that many of us are familiar with the fact that amphetamine or Adderall treats ADHD quite effectively, actually. It's very well tolerated in a lot of people. However, there is a lot of concern that it's being prescribed to children too early and causing other issues later on in life due to early exposure to amphetamines and the way that that changes your brain chemistry as a child. There is a lot of conflicting evidence there and more needs to be known. Um, but then there's Parkinson's, and this is something that is a really interesting potential side effect of chronic high dose uses of stimulants, particularly methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is the major one here because, 
again, Parkinson's is a disease that arises as a result of a dysfunction in dopamine systems. And methamphetamine similarly induces dysfunction in dopamine systems over sufficient time and usage. So Parkinson's is characterized by like slump forward and motor tremors. And remember that dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's responsible for regulating motor control. So we can kind of see immediately, right, how Parkinson's symptoms could arise from chronic heavy high doses of stimulants. And then there's depression um, or anxiety. And oftentimes, just acutely, stimulants do induce anxiety. Like, pretty much across the board, stimulants will induce anxiety. The degree to which they induce anxiety is dose-dependent and dependent on the person, but depression and anxiety are rarely helped by stimulants, except in some cases, in some cases, it is possible, but generally not at higher doses on a long-term scale. Um, if you're not familiar with these terms already, just as a quick note, um, railing something is snorting it. Um, snorting a line, railing a line is a common phrase, is just where you rack out, <laughs> rack out a line, rail it. I know it sounds like a joke. I'm just thinking about what it would sound like to me if I'd never heard any of these terms before. <laughs> so if you're going to chop up a line, you often will use like a credit card or other kind of like solid surface and like mush up your crystals into finer powder and then push it together into a line on a plate, roll up some kind of device and snort it. Dollar bills are the grossest things to use for this, okay? There was a study that showed that like something like 98% of dollar bills had both cocaine and blood on them. If you're putting it up your nose, I guarantee that someone else has put that same dollar bill up their nose. And when you're snorting something, it's going to cause tiny microscopic tears on your mucous membranes and your sinuses, which means that tiny microscopic drops of blood can get on shared snorting devices, which means that you can get HIV and hep C from sharing snorting devices. A lot of people don't believe me when I say you can get HIV from this, but the fact that tiny microscopic tears can cause blood to get onto this means that you actually absolutely can. You can back that up if you would like. Yes, that is a very long key. Or is it? I think it's just a close-up photo, y'all. I don't have my keys next to me. I was supposed to look. Right, so a key bump is another very common method of doing drugs. You have a bag of powder. You have your friends build you a tent at the stage at Said the Sky at Okeechobee, and then you, like, crouch down, dig around in your bag, don't actually know how much is on your key, and hope for the best. Key bumps are a <laughs> very common method of practice, but... Here's the issue with key bumps. Keys have different numbers of ridges in them and different depths of ridges. So if you're scooping a key bump that's like a few millimeters tall on one person's key, it might have a totally different quantity of drugs on it than someone else's key. <laughs> so it's really hard to generalize key bumps across keys, right? So it's a good idea if you're gonna use this method to use the same key repeatedly. But I also encourage you to remember that you stick this key into locks and unless you're sanitizing your key between bumps, which somehow I don't think that you are, it's pretty nasty, honestly. So that's why all the better to snort the drugs with your kid, children. That's why I recommend a tutor. I have no idea why this was the term that the harm reduction community settled on for this device. I think it was a mistake, um, but they're called tutors. These are devices that you can use to snort things, but specifically, Metal ones that have this kind of rounded surface on the bottom are great because you can sterilize them and they're used specifically for you snorting your own drugs. So that's awesome. Dance Safe sells these, just want to let you know. Then there's a Pizzo, which is a meth pipe, pipe and a Pookie, which is a crack pipe. And I always think that they sound really cute together, like Pizzo and Pookie go to the store or like Pizzo and Pookie bake a cake, like a children's book, but it's a meth pipe and a crack pipe. You can smoke other things out of these though. You can smoke DMT out of a Pizzo. You can smoke like I think you can smoke um, a lot of things after out of a pookie, actually. It's like a chillum almost. So many terms for smoking devices. Um, but pizzos are frequently used for smoking crack and methamphetamine, but also DMT and like free base of other things. You can smoke a lot out of these things. Now, the real risk with this, though, is that look how short this is, okay? And imagine that you're holding flame to the bottom of this and you have these really hot, multi hundred degree rocks inside of this device you're having a really high risk at this point of burning your own face and lips on this. So a lot of people actually present to emergency rooms with burns on their faces and on their fingers from getting too close to a, a crack pipe, basically, or a pizzo. 
and having the results in chemical burns. Sucks. A lot of people use stimulants for medical purposes. There are a whole bunch of stimulants in this realm. There's Vyvanse, there's Ritalin, there's Adderall, there's like all kinds of shit. But they're also used really heavily in recreational party environments. Like just get a load of this guy right here. <laughs> He's a little bit too stiff looking to be exclusively on MDMA, but what do I know, you know? Um, but they're also used for the purpose of productivity. And increasingly we're seeing novel stimulants such as um, modafinil. Is anyone in here familiar with modafinil? It's what good for like not being tired if you didn't get a good night's sleep. Yes, and we'll go further into modafinil later. It's a really interesting one. It's an it's a narcolepsy drug. It's an, an it's a wakefulness agent. And it's being, yeah, exactly, it's being increasingly used in other contexts off-label. It's used in the military, it's used by truck drivers and pilots. So stimulants are used in a lot of different settings, but modafinil isn't recreational like other drugs are. Why don't they make longer pizzos? That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I would imagine that it would have something to do with like you ha needing to have like a certain amount of space between your your mouth drawing air in and where the actual smoke is. Um, similarly to why weed pipes are not usually like a foot long, right? I think that the closer it is to your mouth, the more air pressure you can generate. I've seen long ass pizzos. Well, there you have it. Long ass pizzos exist. We called it Gandalf. All right, I'm moving on. So amphetamine in particular is frequently found in Europe, but it's also manufactured in Mexico and brought into the United States. In fact, Mexico is a major manufacturing point of amphetamine in particular and methamphetamine, but Europe is huge on amphetamine, usually amphetamine salts. And this means that it's like straight amphetamine powder. It's very common. It's also known as paste sometimes. Um, and Europe just exports amphetamine like crazy all over the place. Canada and Australia are also pretty major um, consumers of amphetamine. So amphetamine type stimulants, generally speaking, are going to be Schedule II drugs. They've been designated by the federal government as having a high potential for abuse and some accepted medical value. Um, this includes amphetamine, which is Adderall, basically. And it's not just amphetamine, like it's that's kind of a simplification of what Adderall is, but we're going to call it amphetamine for these purposes. Um, the dose of amphetamine slash Adderall is between 10 and 40 milligrams approximately, um, especially in pill form. They're usually prescribed in 10s or 20s, and they're known as Adderall in some cases. Vyvanse, is that? Yeah, Vyvanse is like more of one part of amphetamine than another also known as speed. Amphetamine is just known as speed, which can get a little bit messy because some people interpret that to mean meth. So if someone is like, I'm speeding right now, depending on where you are geographically, that could mean a couple of different things. Um, most frequently in the United States, at least, amphetamine will come in the form of pills when you're intentionally buying it. In the UK and in other areas, if you say, I want amphetamine, you might get like a bag of powder. And if you're trying to buy Adderall, you might be really confused. Although it is effectively the main ingredient in Adderall, right? Um, it can also come in the form of capsules. And I, I've had questions in the past of why I would have two ones. And the idea behind this was that these tie for first place of most common, but it doesn't make any sense. So we're gonna ignore that. Um, these Adderall contain, or these, these capsules are usually XRs, they're extended release which means that it's a salt that is timed release basically to give you more of this Adderall lift throughout the day. And this is very helpful for people that have really treatment resistant ADHD that need a continuous dose of Adderall to remain functional. And then there's powder form. And again, this is most popular in Europe. However, if any of you here have done what you believe to be cocaine in the past, I almost guarantee that it was actually just mostly amphetamine powder with maybe a little bit of coke and some cattle dewormer mixed in or none of the above, but I guarantee that you've done some amphetamine at some point in your life because no coke is coke, generally. When you take standard IR Adderall, instant release Adderall, that's the shorter acting, it lasts about six to eight hours, but really I would say it's four to six hours, depending on how quickly you metabolize it. If you snort it, you come up faster, and this is true of pretty much all drugs. Um, 
your peak is only going to last for like a couple of hours and then you like slowly will start to come down but you do usually come up very quickly as well with mdma usually your come up on mdma is not like a 30 minute long drawn out thing it's often within the span of like five or ten minutes you go from being sober you feel like you're getting thrown down a roller coaster and you coast for a while with amphetamine, it can be quite similar. You can feel all of a sudden a lightening in your chest, like things just get like softer and faster, um, and you suddenly become very acutely aware of like your senses and your environment. Now, in order to stop the kids from snorting these things, because it's common practice to crush and snort Adderall if you want to come up on it faster, which it does work, but it has fillers in it, which makes it a lot more dangerous for your nose holes because you don't know what's used to bind that pill and it could be very toxic and caustic to your sinuses. So to prevent the children from snorting it, they made XR and other like IR salts into this beaded capsule form, which to me look quite a lot like Dippin' Dots. So thank you for this delicious looking advertising. Now another way that people ingest amphetamine is through the means of parachuting. And this is thought to reduce the come up time because a lot of these gelatin capsules will take a little bit longer to break down in your stomach because your body has to break through that thick kind of like the horse scoop material, whatever it's made of. So parachuting is opening a pill, dumping it onto a little piece of toilet paper or tissue paper, one ply, don't go any more than one ply, it's gonna be huge and then rolling it up like a little gift into a pea-sized ball and popping it like a pill. And this does indeed make people come up faster and harder than gelatin capsules because that tissue paper is so much easier to break down. So this is kind of the way that people have gotten around not snorting these is that sometimes people will parachute them as well because it's a very slightly faster come up. And people do this with Molly also. This I think might be a little bit confusing, so we're going to ignore that, but if you have questions, you can ask me later. Um, amphetamine is primarily a dopamine and norepinephrine agonist. It is a releasing agent of these neurotransmitters as well as being a reuptake inhibitor. So immediately we can kind of get an idea for that. We got swipe or no swiping, goes up in through the transporter, sneaky swiper, and then pops these neurotransmitter containing bubbles and flood the synapse, but like Molly, just a little bit, you know, he's just kind of like whoop, dabbling in there and then also blocks reuptake transporters. And it does the same thing with dopamine and norepinephrine, although dopamine to a larger extent. Now, historically speaking, amphetamine has been used in quite a wide array of contexts, starting, I mean, really gaining popularity in the 40s, um, especially as a weight loss agent for women because that's just what a lot of these drugs were used for was like to make women less hysterical or lose weight. So amphetamine was actually marketed as being like, stay slim, take amphetamine. And Benzedrine became the really popular form of this. And this was actually really popular among the Beats and the Beatniks, which we'll get to soon in a later unit about psychedelic culture um, and counterculture. But benzedrine sulfate tablets became very popular as prescriptions for women and also the original weight loss drugs. Yeah, exactly. Um, these became very popular among a lot of counterculture groups as well as just like among people in general. And Hitler loved amphetamine. Who would have known? Um, he used amphetamine very frequently. In fact, these things called pet pills which was just amphetamine, were given frequently to Nazi soldiers and also US soldiers at a certain point in time. Um, a lot of military efforts have involved the use of stimulants among soldiers. In fact, Hitler was so fucked up, in case you're not already aware of this fact, that he really enjoyed doing what became known actually later as a purple heart combination among a group of counterculture youth in the UK, which is where you would inject amphetamine into one arm, and barbiturates into the other. And that is a combination of like basically a benzodiazepine adjacent drug and amphetamine at the same time. And Hitler was really big into this. <laughs> now currently, amphetamine is banned in major league baseball. This is known as greenies um, because amphetamine actually does allow your body to retain increased muscle tone 